Good afternoon. My name is uh, Juan Uriagereca. I'm uh, Associate Provost for Faculty Affairs. Um, I normally introduce these events with some light anecdote or some joke. Um, I'm a Basque, and uh, this topic is very close to my heart. Uh, so um, forgive me if this time I don't have a joke to tell you. Um, uh, my family is from Guernica. You may be familiar with the famous Picasso painting. My dad was eight when that bombing took place uh, 75 years ago. Um, so it hit quite uh, close to home. Um, and that was just the beginning of a very complicated period that lasted unto, until about a year ago uh, when there was a peace uh, accord signed. Uh, I won't go into any of the details of that. I just will say that uh, over a thousand people uh, died in the recent periods since my lifetime. This is after uh, the initial mention of Guernica that I was alluding to. Um, I know lots of people that were uh, involved in these sorts of situations on both sides. I, uh, at some point, uh, was taken in by uh, the police into police custody myself. I, let me tell you, I had absolutely nothing to do with any of these things, but these are collateral damages. And soon after that, I actually found one policeman who had been shot, and I helped take him to hospital. It is in the madness of this spiral of violence, one of the main reasons that I decided to come uh, here to graduate school. So these things are very close to home. And um, I am very impressed that people like Gary, my friend, uh, have the capacity to help us contextualize and understand things uh, of this caliber. Uh, it's with great honor that I uh, welcome you as our new, uh, one of our new distinguished scholar teachers. Um, it is an honor for us, and um, uh, without uh, further ado, I will introduce Sally as the person that will give you a proper introduction. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Distinguished Scholar Teacher Lecture ho hosted by the Office of Administrative Affairs. My name is Sally Simpson. I am, unlike your program says, I am the former chair of the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. I apologize to Charles, it's only been about a month and I'm trying to wrestle control back from him for the department. But in any case, I have the privilege today of introducing distinguished scholar teacher, Dr. Gary LaFree. But before I do, let me take this opportunity to say a few words about him. Twelve years ago, with incredible foresight and a degree of luck, CCJS on campus managed to entice Gary to join our faculty. A world-renowned scholar prior to him coming to the University of Maryland, Dr. LaFree's research has always been exemplary and highly influential. However, his successes at Maryland have led to a research agenda that have pushed the traditional boundaries of criminology and criminal justice in many new directions. Despite the fact that terrorism fundamentally engages two central themes of criminology, justice and etiology, the study of terrorism has been neglected by criminologists. Professor LaFree has helped to change the situation and to bring the study of terrorism and responses to terrorism into the mainstream of criminology and criminal justice research and education. Through his work as lead investigator and director of the National Consortium of the, of, um, the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, aka START, on campus, LaFree has played a major role in the design and completion of some 60 projects involving individual researchers and research teams all over the world. Their work has been supported by more than 40 million in research funding and projects worth an additional $25 million are planned in the years ahead. And Gary probably has an update on that figure. Um, I'm probably way out of date on that. 
As president of the American Society of Criminology in 2005 to 2006, Gary added terrorism and responses to terrorism as a recognized section of research and education. And this tradition has been continued by subsequent presidents of ASC. It should be clear that Professor Lafree has had an extraordinary impact on the criminology of terrorism, but his contributions extend far beyond the development of a rich new research tradition. Through his efforts at start, and in a relatively short time, Lafree has done much to establish the study of terrorism as a critical and exciting area of education and learning. More than 500, or, let's see, I'm sorry. Oh, it is true. More than 500 graduate students and postdocs and pre-docs and research assistants have worked in this important area, and they will be the, the researchers of tomorrow in this very important area. Gary has trained many of these students himself, serving on nearly 40 MA and PhD committees, often as the thesis or dissertation chair. Now, in sum, the significance of Gary LaFree's research and educational efforts cannot be overstated. We are proud of his accomplishments, and I am honored, honored to introduce him to you today to deliver his distinguished scholar-teacher lecture. I give you Dr. Gary LaFree. So I feel the pressure is on with, uh, this is an audience that I'm not used to addressing, not only professional colleagues, people I work with at uh, government, family, friends, neighbors, uh, associates from the START Center. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about the research that I've been engaged in for the past uh, 10 years. So I should start with thanks. I could probably spend my whole time thanking people in this room, but I want to thank especially uh, the Criminology Criminal Justice Department and the START Center for helping set up this talk, uh, especially uh, Charlene Warner and especially Jessica Ravinius, who've been uh, very important in terms of all of the logistics. I'm delighted today that I'm joined by my family, my wife Vicki in the front, uh, my daughters Katie and Alex, uh, my sister Barbara, all in from out of town, and my mother Betty. Uh, in fact, uh, Betty and Barbara came all the way from northern Indiana, drove in yesterday to be here, and uh, my daughter Katie flew in from Denver, so it's especially good to have you all here. I'm sure you'll tell me about all the mistakes I've made uh, later on. Um, like most academics, uh, when I'm not busy complaining about my job, I'm thinking to myself how lucky I am to have such a rewarding job. And much of this excitement is due to working in a research center at a great university. I'm constantly amazed at how much I've learned from my colleagues at the START Center and the Criminology Department. And in particular, I know in the audience I want to recognize uh, the contributions and friendship of Bill Braniff, Gary Ackerman, Aaron Miller, Brandon Bailendorf, Grace Sewell, Kate Isaac, Sarah Fishering, John Sawyer, Sue Kumar. It's a long list. And I was surprised to see also, I don't know, I don't know if she's out there somewhere, but Kathy Smerick, our former executive director, has driven in from New Jersey to be here as well. Most of the research I'm going to talk about today was funded by the National Institute of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security, and there's a kind of uh, inside joke about people talking about getting funded, but the truth is a lot of the work we do can't happen without funding to make the wheels turn, and that's especially true in, in data-intensive projects. So it's especially gratifying to have in the audience today John Laub, the director of the National Institute of Justice, and his lovely wife Joanne, um, and also I think Matt Clark is out there somewhere, who's the director of university programs at DHS, and also Joe Kielman, who uh, funded us at a critical time in DHS uh, in, in terms of the GTD, a critical time in our history as well. So it's really good to have you all here. The research I'm going to present uh, would simply not have been possible without uh, these contributions. I'll save some time at the end of my talk for questions and comments, and of course, we will welcome you all to stay afterwards for refreshments. As you see in the program, my talk today involves black swans. And I want to make sure that this reference is not confused with the recent movie of the same name starring Natalie Portman. And by the way, you all know why black swans can travel faster than other swans cross country, because they take the red eye. <laughs> 
And I bring this up in part to start with a bit of levity because as Juan very elegantly said just a moment ago, the talk today is very serious and actually controversial, uh, the topic of terrorism. And in fact, academics and policymakers have long disagreed about exactly what terrorism is and exactly how to define it. In my discussions about it today, I'm going to be referring to acts which involve violence or the threat of violence by someone other than a government for a political purpose. So in other words, this definition excludes ordinary crime, it excludes state terrorism, excludes genocide, topics that are very important and complex enough to warrant their own discussions. The central theme of my lecture this afternoon is that terrorism has two characteristics that make it especially prone to myth-making. On the one hand is its black swan nature, and on the other hand, its bursty nature. Essayist Nassim Taleb defines a black swan incident as one that falls outside the realm of regular expectations, has a high impact, and defies prediction. The term uh, he uses is actually based on the observation that before they visited Australia, Europeans had assumed that all swans were white, an assumption that at the time was supported, for Europeans at least, by their own experience. Talib claims that the coordinated terrorist attacks of 9-1-1 are a perfect example of a black swan event because they were unexpected, had a huge impact on history, and were difficult to predict. So one of the major challenges in responding to terrorism is that a handful of very rare cases can have a disproportionate effect on setting the agenda for the phenomena more generally. In some ways, uh, I know we have a lot of criminologists in the audience, and this isn't too different than criminology in general. If you think about it, the vast majority of the thousands of homicides in the United States each year are depressingly prosaic events involving drunken relatives, barroom brawls that get out of hand, jilted lovers seeking quick revenge. It's relatively few cases, the ones that are especially heinous, though, that capture the public attention and often result in major policy changes. For example, the chilling attack on Matthew Wayne Shepard, a gay student at the University of Wyoming, was, who was tortured and, and murdered near Laramie, Wyoming in October of 1998, directly led to the passage of federal and state hate crime legislation. Similarly, the brutal rape and murder of Jessica Marie Lumsford, a nine-year-old girl who was abducted from her home in Florida in February 2005, resulted in harsh new laws designed to punish sex offenders and reduce their ability to reoffend. I'm fond of saying that all science begins with counting things, atoms, earthquakes, distance from the earth to the sun, or worldwide terrorist attacks. And unfortunately, one of the things we have to be able to do is count things, even uh, really unpleasant things, like this kind of violent activity. And with terrorism, even more than with these high-profile kinds of crimes, the amount of public attention uh, received by a particular act can be even greater. And the resulting impact on social policy of a high-profile act can be even more significant. So to return, black swans are rare but highly visible events that provoke an almost unavoidable policy response that may have far-reaching consequences and even game-changing implications. So that's the first characteristic I want to talk about. The second, the bursty uh, characteristic, which my family has been making jokes about all morning, actually. Bursty distributions are simply those that are highly concentrated in time and space. And recent research has shown that diverse phenomena are, in fact, bursty, including streams of email messages, traffic on crowded freeways, frequency of forest fires, and, of course, the global distribution of terrorism. In fact, I'll argue today that these two qualities, black swans and burstiness, are a large part of what make terrorism so challenging to the modern world. On the one hand, terrorism is relatively infrequent and hard to predict, but on the other hand, when it starts to happen, there's a tendency for it to happen in the same place a lot. The main purpose of my talk today is to put these two general characteristics of terrorism into a broader context by looking not just at one or two exceptional cases, but all of the cases that have happened in the world since 1970. Gathering a comprehensive global database on terrorism is not an easy task. In fact, on the day after 9-11, no such database existed. No one on the planet could tell us definitively how many terrorist attacks were happening worldwide or whether total attacks were increasing or declining over time. And this gets me back to the saying that if you're going to have a science, you have to be able to count things. 
not just atoms and earthquakes or distance from the sun, but also worldwide terrorist attacks. It seems clear that we can't do a very good job of fighting terrorism if we can't first count how much of it there is. You can imagine trying to construct policies to reduce crime without knowing how much crime there is or to reduce cancer without knowing how much cancer there is. And this stubborn fact posed a central irony in our approaches to terrorism in the first half of this uh, se last century. While effective policy against terrorism depends hard on hard data, objective analysis, until recently, the study of terrorism has lagged far behind many other fields in the social and behavioral sciences. My favorite quote on the subject, which is now a few years old, is from a psychologist, a British psychologist, Andrew Silkey, which I have on the screen. And I would say, don't put this guy on your tenure review committee. Um, what my colleagues and I set out to do after 9-1-1 was to develop a database on terrorism that would track every known attack around the world and would systematically code its major characteristics. Who committed the attack, what happened during the attack, where it happened, when it happened, and anything we could determine about why it happened. And in fact, over the past 10 years, we have developed such a database here at the University of Maryland. The Global Terrorism Database, or GTD, now includes nearly 100,000 terrorist attacks from everywhere on the planet that took place from 1970 until the present. In fact, I imagine that quite a few people in this room are more familiar with the GTD than they probably want to be. How many people are, have worked on the GTD in here? Can I see? Yeah, quite a number of you. Over the past 10 years, hundreds of Maryland undergraduate and graduate students have worked on this database. The difficulties of cataloging any phenomena are frequently challenging. Consider this. When Sh William Shakespeare was writing Romeo and Juliet in the 1600s, he could not reach onto his bookshelf for an English language dictionary that would tell him whether a particular word he used was properly spelled or whether he had used it in the right way. It was much later before anyone in the English-speaking world developed a published reference work that could be used to look up the spelling and the meaning of English words. In a way, cataloging, cataloging terrorist attacks presents a similar problem. How does one go about cataloging every terrorist attack on the planet? In criminology, we generally gather data on crime in three ways, either by talking to police, by talking to crime victims, or talking to offenders. All three of these sources are problematic, though, when it comes to collecting data on terrorism. Police departments and other criminal agencies collect vast amounts of detailed official data on common crimes in most countries, but rarely is this the case for terrorism. Part of the difficulty is that no one agrees on the definition of terrorism. Even the United Nations has, to this point in time, not succeeded in coming up with a universal definition. Moreover, terrorist attacks often cut across several more common types of criminal categories. So an assassination might be included in police data as a, homi as a homicide, but not as terrorism. To further complicate things, a large number of terrorist attacks have no identified offender, about half of them in our database, in fact. And even in those cases where an offender is identified, many of those suspected of terrorism are not legally processed for terrorism. They're frequently taken through the courts for other crimes, like weapons possession, money laundering, and so on. So you can go to victims of terrorism, but this also is of limited value. Frequently, terrorism victims have no direct contact with the perpetrators. In many other cases, terrorism victims are killed by their attackers, which leaves you with going to offenders. You can talk to offenders about their past experiences as terrorists, but this raises some very obvious challenges. Most active terrorists are unwilling to participate in interviews, and even if they're willing to participate, getting access to known terrorists for research purposes is going to be pretty difficult for a typical middle-class professor in the field, as is somewhat humorously depicted in this slide which shows a couple of prof uh, uh, barbarians with a professor of barbarian studies. <laughs> so you sort of get the point. For all these reasons, traditional sources of data on terrorism have been difficult or even impossible to collect. However, those interested in studying terrorism have a unique advantage over those studying other types of crime because terrorists, unlike most common criminals, actively seek media attention. Terrorism researchers have frequently pointed out, in fact, that much terrorism is simply political theater. Terrorist attacks are often care carefully choreographed to attract the attention of the electronic media and the international press. In fact, the media are so central to contemporary terrorist groups that many researchers and policymakers 
argued that the birth of modern terrorism is directly linked to the launch by the United States of the first television satellite in 1968. In 1968, the availability of satellite technology and portable video equipment made it possible for the first time in human history to send instantaneously images of conflict and violence from any place on the planet to any other place. And in fact, this development was not at all missed by terrorist organizations. On July 22, 1968, three armed members of the Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command hijacked an El Al commercial flight scheduled to fly from Rome to Tel Aviv. The hijackers diverted the El Al plane and its 48 occupants to Algeria, releasing some passengers but holding five Israeli passengers and seven crew members hostage. The terrorists demanded the release of Palestinian guerrillas being held in Israel prisons uh, in exchange for the hostages. The resulting negotiations were broadcast live around the world. In many ways, this event made possible for the first time the event database that we now call here the Global Terrorism Database. The fact that terrorists are specifically seeking to attract attention through the media means that compared to media coverage of more common crimes, coverage of terrorism can tell us a lot more. In fact, it's hard to imagine that it's any longer possible for an aerial hijacking or a politically motivated assassination, even in remote parts of the world, to elude the scrutiny of the global media. In some ways, the talk this afternoon began on a cloudy afternoon about 11 years ago, just after 9-1-1. I rode the metro out from suburban Maryland to the offices of the Pinkerton Global Intelligence Service, located in a tall modern office complex in Northern Virginia. PGIS is a relative of the Pinkertons, the famous Scottish detective agency. A graduate student at the University of Maryland, Doug Loveland, who I doubt is in the audience. Doug, no? Uh, an ex-Air Force intelligence officer had told me that a colleague of his who worked with PGIS had explained to him that the company had been collecting data on terrorist attacks around the world for nearly three decades and that they might be willing to share this information with a university researcher. The PGIS data appealed to me because I spent most of my academic career examining databases that include archived information on violent crimes, homicides, robberies, rapes. I explained to admi administrators at PGIS that I thought many in the research and policy communities would be very interested in the data that they had collected, and apparently I was convincing because the administrators at PGIS agreed to let me transport the original data to the University of Maryland for analysis. Here's what it looked like <laughs> 10 years ago. PGIS trained researchers to identify and record terrorist attacks from wire services like Reuters. They used uh, State Department reports. They went through hard copies of newspapers. So they looked at newspapers like the New York Times and the London Financial Times. In more recent years, of course, they began to rely on the internet much more. The PGIS data collection changed over time, but it was intriguing because it stayed pretty similar for 28 years of data collection. They had only two people supervising the data collection during that period, both of whom have now passed away but were very helpful to us in the beginning of the project. But the single most unique aspect of the PGIS data is that from the very beginning, they included domestic as well as international terrorist attacks. Domestic attacks are those where the group responsible, their target, and the country in which the attack takes place are all the same. So a terrorist group from the U.S. attacking a U.S. target in the U.S. would be a domestic case. A Greek terrorist group attacking in the U.S. or a U.S. group attacking in another country would be an international case. And PGIS was the only early terrorism database to collect data on both. Once I obtained permission from P PGIS to computerize their data, I invited a colleague of mine in criminology, Laura Dugan, to collaborate on the project. Laura and I then wrote a grant to the National Institute of Justice to computerize the original PGIS data. We computerized and reconstructed a version of it uh, with, about the, with the help of about 100 Maryland students. And after all this effort, which concluded in 2005, we found ourselves in possession of a terrorism database that was interesting, but was already becoming severely dated because PGIS had stopped collecting data in 1997. So fortunately for us, with support from Department of Homeland Security, especially the Office of University Programs, the START Center opened its doors in January 2005, and since then the START Center's projects have been able to maintain the database uh, with the support of DHS.
Starting in 2012, uh, the START Center is actually going to be supplying official terrorism data to the U.S. State Department for its annual report to Congress on terrorism. And uh, the 2011 data will be available anytime, I think within the next two weeks, right? More or less, we're expecting, so quite soon. So for the rest of my talk this afternoon, I want to use the GTD to put global terrorism into a broader context. In particular, I want to consider some of the myths generated by the incredible impact of 911 and to demonstrate how their bursty nature might actually help inform future research. And I'll talk very uh, quickly about nine myths about terrorism that have been strongly influenced by the black swan nature of 911. And I call these myths in the everyday sense that they are conclusions that are fictitious or unscientific. Myth number one. Terrorist attacks were rapidly increasing in the years leading up to 9-1-1, is a common one. The tragic events of 9-1-1 had an immediate and dramatic impact on levels of public concern about terrorism in the United States and well beyond. Accordingly, many observers assumed that terrorist attacks and fatalities were up sharply in the years before 9-1-1. But in fact, the GTD tells a different, more complicated story. The red line on top tracks uh, total terrorist attacks, and as you can see from this red line, uh, the peak is not anywhere close to 2001. In fact, the peak is in 1992, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Total one one were about the same level as they had been in the mid-1970s. In fact, in the four years prior to 9-1-1, worldwide terrorist attacks were at the lowest level they'd been at for 20 years, even though in the last few years they have begun again to go up. So they're again approaching these high levels. Myth number two, terrorist attacks reach every corner of the world. The ubiquity of modern communication systems means that individuals are now continuously bombarded by images of terrorist attacks from around the globe. You can ask yourselves how many times you've seen the iconic image of uh, fully loaded jet planes crashing into the World Trade Center towers. This blanket media coverage leaves the impression that lo no location on the planet is safe from terrorism. But in fact, our analysis of the GTD indicates that terrorist attacks are highly concentrated in a relatively few places. I'll just give a quick example here on the screen by looking at the top 10 countries in terms of the database from 1970 to 2010. And what you can see from this is about 5% of all countries of the world account for about 50% of all terrorist attacks. If we push it up to 10% of the world's countries, we find 75% of all attacks in the world. So in fact, they're quite concentrated in geospace. Myth number three. The U.S. is more frequently targeted by terrorists than any other country in the world. The devastating impact of 9-1-1 led many observers, both in the United States and abroad, to assume that the U.S. is a target of an inordinate number of terrorist attacks. However, when we use the GTD again to examine the frequency of attacks and the number of fatalities by country, we find that the U.S. ranks about 14th in the world in terms of total attacks and about 16th in the world in terms of total fatalities, which is shown in this graph right here. So 14 in terms of attacks, 16 in terms of fatalities. The most frequently attacked country in our data set is Colombia, and the country with the most terrorist fatalities is Iraq. And in fact, while the U.S. ranks 16th in terms of fatalities, 90% of these are from the single coordinated attacks of 911. If you back these out, the U.S. fatalities look much more like Canada or Greece. Myth number four, most terrorist attacks involve disgruntled groups and individuals from one country carrying out attacks on civilians in other countries. Again, the tremendous impact of 911 encourages us to think about terrorism as being mostly about unhappy individuals from one country attacking innocent civilians from another country. To examine this issue, my colleagues and I looked at the attack patterns of the 52 foreign terrorist groups that were identified by the U.S. State Department as posing the single greatest threat to U.S. security. And in this graph, we look at whether these groups were attacking domestic or transnational targets. The uh, lines in uh, yellow are the domestic and the red are transnational. These results even surprised us. We found that more than nine times out of 10, these groups operated at home against local targets. This means that groups located in, for example, Pakistan were far more likely to use terrorist violence against non-U.S. targets in Pakistan 
than they were to attack U.S. targets either in Pakistan or the U.S. homeland. Myth number five, terrorism is unrelated to traditional political grievances. Again, because of the irrationality of Al-Qaeda-inspired 911, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that a large number of terrorist attacks involve fairly rational political disputes over territory. When we use the GTD to identify the most active terrorist organizations in, in the world, we find that a large proportion of them, which are shown here, the top 10, involve groups organized around disputes that have to do with political control over territory. Although there are major differences, of course, in these 10 groups, if you look at this list, nearly all of them are about fighting for the control of territory. So they have pretty rational goals. You may not agree with them, but you at least know where they're coming from. Myth number six, most terrorist attacks are incredibly lethal. Again, because the highly, of the highly uh, lethal terrorist attack of 911, it's easy to suppose that most, of terrorist, most terrorist attacks are incredibly lethal. However, from the GTD, we find that more than half of all terrorist attacks since 1970 involved no fatalities. How can this be, that so many terrorist attacks did not result in fatalities? Well, many incidents are directed at property, at bridges, electric plants, factories. Other attacks are aimed at civilians, but they fail. And in many other cases, terrorist groups provide a warning to civilians before striking. This was a common practice for ETA and the IRA, and it used to be a common practice for the weather underground. And so despite the fact that uh, we do have uh, you know, some very troublesome attacks, about 1,200 that produce more than 12, 25 fatalities, nevertheless, about half of all the terrorist attacks in the database since 1970 produce no fatalities. Myth number seven, most terrorist attacks rely on sophisticated weaponry. The coordinated attacks of 911 involve long-term planning, split-second timing, and an innovative use of existing resources. And the sophistication of 911 pales into significance compared to the diabolical sophistication of the enemies that Claire Danes, Kiefer Sutherland, Bruce Willis, and other television and media heroes routinely face. These images, no doubt, encourage us to think that most terrorist strikes depend on sophisticated weaponry. But contrary to the view of terrorism that we commonly get from Hollywood, the vast majority of terrorist attacks rely on non-sophisticated, readily accessible weapons, as shown in this slide. According to the GTD database, 80% of all attacks rely on explosives and firearms. And for the most part, the explosives used are relatively common, especially dynamite and grenades. Similarly, the guns available are relatively common, especially shotguns and pistols. Fortunately, sophisticated weapons, including chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, are rare exceptions. Myth number eight, most terrorist organizations are long-lasting and difficult to eradicate. Given the persistence of high-profile, long-lasting groups like Al-Qaeda, the Tamil Tigers, the Irish Republican Army, there's also a common perception that most terrorist groups have long lifespans. The GTD identifies more than 2,000 separate terrorist groups. We gauge their longevity by the amount of time from their first strike to their last known strike. And here is a map of their longevity. We find that nearly 75% 70 of the terrorist organizations in the database last for less than a year. Most terrorist groups are like most business startups. They're very likely to disappear during their first year of operation. Forming and maintaining groups is not all that easy, despite impressions to the contrary. Why do we have the impression that terrorist groups are long-lasting and difficult to eradicate? Probably because we hear so much about the few groups that are successful. But for every Al-Qaeda and ETA, there are many more short-lived, relatively unknown groups, such as the anti-capitalist brigades and the revolutionary flames. And our staff, in fact, has this game they put together where they ask if people can identify some of these obscure groups and they mix them in with uh, names of rock groups. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how infrequently people can separate those two. And finally, myth number nine, terrorist groups are impervious to governmental counter-terrorist policies and rarely make mistakes. We could call this the myth of the super terrorist. The advanced planning, the confidence, and destructiveness of 911 contribute to the notion that terrorist groups are infallible. My colleagues and I at the Start Center, though, have been involved in several research projects using the GTD, which suggest otherwise. 
For example, in a recent study, we used the GTD to examine the targeting strategies of a group called the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia, or As Asala, a very active group based in Turkey. We're especially interested in Asala because after mounting a long series of deadly terrorist attacks throughout the 1970s and early 80s, it disappeared very rapidly, as you can see in this chart. After modeling many possible explanations for this sudden desistance, the, most, the conclusion that was best supported was that they had changed their strategy and picked a lousy strategy, basically. Before the early 1980s, Asala was careful to target Turks and avoided non-Turk targets and especially Armenian casualties. But starting in the early 1980s, they became far less discriminate in their targeting methods. The pivotal attack was on Orly Airport in 1983. An explosive device detonated prematurely on the, in the terminal area by the Turkish Airlines counter, killing eight people, wounding over 50 more. The increasing reliance on random, brutal violence such as the attack on Orly created a polarized and hostile climate among the former supporters of Asala. This change in targeting strategy seriously undermined their legitimacy, and it seriously undermined the legitimacy and their uh, efforts to raise money among the Armenian di diaspora and in the West. Basically, Asala seriously miscalculated the impact of their strategy on their supporters. But there are plenty of other examples of misjudgment and even outright incompetence among terrorists. For example, less than 90 minutes after detonating a massive truck bomb in front of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995, Timothy McVeigh was arrested for driving without a license plate. Similarly, in 1993, a group of Islamic extremists drove a rented bomb-laden van into the, back, un, into the underground parking lot of the World Trade Center complex and using a timer set the bomb to detonate. When the bomb exploded, it killed six people and, wo and wounded over a thousand more. Remarkably, three hours after the explosion, one of the chief conspirators in the plot, Mohammed Salome, returned to the Ryder Rental Agency in New Jersey to get his deposit for the rented van back. It gets better. When the rental company refused to return his $400 deposit without a police report, Salome went to the police to report the van stolen. <laughs> Eventually, Salome's desperate attempts to get his $400 deposit back unraveled the entire conspiracy. So, to summarize about these black swan characteristics of terrorism, contrary to our stereotypes about 911 and a few other extraordinary events, most terrorist attacks for the past four decades have relied on readily available, unsophisticated weaponry, frequently involve few or no fatalities. The typical terrorist group disappears in less than a year, and there's ample evidence that terrorists frequently make strategic errors. Attacks were declining just before 9-1-1, and very few attacks involved disgruntled groups from one country attacking civilians in another country. So if 9-1-1 is a black swan event, why not simply ignore it and go back to business as usual? This might be the advice, in fact, of American satirist H.L. Mencken, who once famously declared that the whole aim of politics is to keep the populace alarmed by menace, by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. The reason why ignoring terrorism is a bad idea is directly related to the second characteristic of terrorism that I mentioned above. It tends to be bursty. When it starts to happen, you tend to get a lot of it rapidly. And we have a lot of examples in the past 10 years through the research we've been conducting at the START Center, and I'll just provide some of these. If you look at attacks against the United States, you tend not to find the same groups doing the attacking, but in fact you have in green a, ser a whole series of groups that were doing attacks in the 70s and then largely disappear. In the purple you have a bunch of attackers in the 80s and then largely disappear. This thing cuts off in 2004. If we went farther, the line would be way up here. And these are all the, the, the jihadi attacks like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So you can sort of see what happens. You get a sort of rapid increase in attacks over a period of time, and then they generally fade off. So it's kind of a wave-like structure. And you, you see this in a lot of areas. This shows every aerial hijacking we could find in the planet all the way back to 1948. And you can see it just out of control in the late 1960s until we came up with metal detectors, which actually ended up being a, very, a fairly effective uh, remedy. But you get this real exposure, you get this real burst. We find the same thing with suicide bombings worldwide. Very few, and then suddenly they're through the roof. 
You find it also with improvised explosive devices. This one goes from 2000 to uh, 2010. You can see once you get something that works, you tend to get a whole lot of it in this area. And researchers are beginning to take more seri seriously this burst equality of ter terrorism as well as the potential burstiness of other types of crime and violence. The general form that burstiness takes can be illustrated in this slide. And this is actually using a crime example. But essentially, if you have one axis that says days between repeat crimes and another axis that says how likely the crime is, what burstiness suggests is you're going to get a lot of it right away and then it falls off in terms of likelihood over time. In criminology, this phenomenon is now referred to as near repeats. There's a rapidly developing literature suggesting that this near repeat pattern may apply to a wide variety of different types of crime and violence. So far, the most extensive application of this has been done on burglaries. Unfortunately, if you're the victim of a burglary, there's a high probability that the offenders will return, and soon. But it turns out that when you're victimized, it also raises the risk for your neighbors. Urban police departments have begun to take these types of statistics into account when they decide how to deploy police officers. But these patterns generalize to other types of violence and crime as well. For example, some recent research suggests that near-repeat patterns provide good estimates for the use of improvised explosive devices. And I brought with me uh, some work by our colleague Jeff Brantingham at UCLA. They looked at improvised explosive device attacks in Najaf province in Iraq, and these are pretty recent data, and they find very strong uh, repeat uh, uh, patterns for uh, IED attacks, basically. And there are other examples as, of this as well, but we've taken this logic and begun now to apply it to terrorism. In a recent study, my colleagues and I examined the spatial and temporal distribution of terrorist attacks by the Basque separatist group ETA in Spain from 1970 on. For the last half century, ETA has been one of the deadliest and longest lasting terrorist organizations in the world. It was founded as a political movement in 1959 and had as its principal goal to separate a homeland for the Basque region. Claimed responsibility for its first fatality in 1968 and it really began to ramp up dramatically in the 1970s. Most of the early attacks by ETA were aimed at controlling the three central provinces in the, that were seen as being at the heart of the Basque homeland, the area that ETA hoped to eventually ru rule. However, as the struggle wore on, members of ETA began to feel that the strategy of conducting violent attacks in the Basque region was not likely to produce a victory for the cause of a separate Basque homeland. This view was strengthened in 1975 when the death, with the death of longtime dictator Francisco Franco. As Spain moved more firmly in the direction of democracy, ETA supporters began to see it as less and less likely that their localized rebellion would win the support of the entire country. Accordingly, the leadership of ETA signaled a major policy shift in 1978. Instead of limiting attack to the Basque region that they hoped to control, they would instead strike broadly throughout Spain and try to wear down the government until it met their demands. In fact, they even made a convenient public statement to that effect. In 1978, one of the leaders of ETA said publicly, quote, the function of the armed struggle is not to destroy the enemy, but to force him through a prolonged psychological and physical attrition to abandon our territory due to exhaustion and isolation. So we read this, uh, these interesting reports and we were now armed with our newly collected domestic terrorism data on Spain from the GTD and we tried to determine whether this public announcement could be observed in the geospatial patterns of terrorist strikes in Spain. We divided ETA attacks into two periods, before and after the official announcement and here's what the attacks look like. So before 1978, you see the darker regions represents the three provinces uh, in the Basque country where virtually all the attacks were. There was an attack down here in, uh, in the, a little bit in the southern part and a few in the north, but generally very concentrated. By the period 1979 on, though, we're now getting attacks routinely throughout the entire country. In fact, at this point in time, at one point in time after 1979, uh, the attacks were in 41 out of 47 of the uh, provinces of Spain. So it had become truly a national effort. And interestingly, they did exactly what they said they were going to do in the official announcement. Uh, 
We also started thinking though, but could we use these sorts of uh, reasoning to actually make other kinds of forecasts? In other words, looking at the patterns of the strikes, could we tell anything about uh, where the next strikes were going to be? And we found that there were some things we could do. So what this model shows, a statistical model showing uh, how good we could predict where the night next strike was going to be based on the previous strike. And the, the thing here that says phase two, 1980 to 2007, in a statistical way replicates the finding that you already see in the map. So in other words, they're much less likely to strike within the uh, Basque region after uh, 1979. We also found other kinds of characteristics that help us predict where the next strike was going to be. In fact, the longer the time between strikes, the more likely the strike is going to be in a distant location. If the strike's going to be close to the Basque country, uh, they tend to happen much more rapidly. We found also interesting regional variations. The Basque country, the BAC, uh, were more likely to be the target of repeat strikes. So is Navarra, which is a sort of fourth province that kind of could tip into a Basque homeland. On the other hand, Madrid tended to be isolated. So an attack in Madrid tended to be a one-off kind of an attack. So uh, armed with this kind of information, we were interested in seeing if we could push this a bit farther. Uh, in the next analysis we, uh, we attempted, and this was work being done, it was done by myself, Brandon Balendorf, and Rick Legault, who I think are both in the audience today. We relied again on the ETA data, but this time we also examined geocoded data from a second terrorist group that operated in El Salvador, the Farabundi Marti National Liberation Front, or FMLN. The first attacks by the FMLN in the GTD database happened in 1980, their last attacks in 1992. Quite different groups, the FMLN was much more interested not in controlling a portion of El Salvador, but taking over the whole country. So it was much more of a violent insurgency. In this analysis, we were especially interested in measuring what we called microcycles, which are directly related to this notion of burstiness. That is localized bursts of criminal or violent attacks. We began by classifying 2,000 terrorist attacks attributed to ETA and 3,300 terrorist attacks attributed to the FMLN into a space-time grid shown here. So essentially, we've got at the top ETA attacks and at the bottom FMLN attacks. And you can see they're not randomly distributed. This on this side is how many miles away the next attack is, and this is how long in time the next attack is. And the darker the, the lines, the more unequal the distribution. So you can see a, not at all a random distribution, but it's pretty spread out all over. But as we started to get into this more, we found that a very large proportion of these cases were in fact right up in this upper quadrant up here, which we call microcycles in the analysis that we got into. So if we look at these, uh, if we look at just these microcycles, we found that for ETA, 52% of all attacks happened within microcycles that were within two weeks and five miles of each other. 60% happened within microcycles that were within two weeks and 10 miles of each other. And the concentration was even greater for the FMLN. 67% of FMLN attacks happened within microcycles that were within two weeks and five miles of each other and 81% happened within microcycles of two weeks and 10 miles of each other. Moreover, we found that compared to other attacks, attacks that were part of microcycles had significantly different characteristics in both countries. For example, tactics used by terrorist organizations in both countries were directly related to whether they were part of microcycles. So for example, you see here that bombings are very likely to be part of microcycles, significantly related. On the other hand, assassinations and armed assaults are much more be likely to be isolated events. Fatalities are also related to microcycles. If you get lots of, uh, if you get a fatal attack, it's more likely to be a part of a microcycle, part of, of this kind of bursty behavior. We also found that microcycles predict location pretty well, that microcycles are more likely to be waged against national capitals, at regional capitals, at least in ETA, not in FMLN, and also in what we call here defended space. So in other words, in the kind of military and the, the, the sort of brains of the organization. Uh, so closer to where the base of operations are, you're more likely to get these kind of events.
So while these results are preliminary, they give us some reason to hope that analysis of the spatial and temporal patterns of terrorism might help to guide policies on countering terrorism as well as other types of criminal violence. Really in the same way that police are beginning to use this kind of information to do a more effective job in, in policing. Which brings me to a few conclusions. I've argued that policies on terrorism are strongly affected by black swan events and that 911 is a good example of such an event. It was unexpected, of great magnitude, and had a huge impact on policy. But in addition, terrorism has a burst equality. When it's effective in a particular time and place, we tend to get a lot of it rapidly. This last point suggests that it would be foolhardy to ignore the threats posed. In fact, in this regard, early events may be a harbinger of things to come. There's a brilliant portrayal of a similar idea in the classic Alfred Hitchcock film, The Birds, which many of you will remember. There's this great scene when a single bird lands on the jungle gym equipment behind Melanie Daniels, the rich socialite played by Tippi Hedren. On February 16, 1993, a truck bomb in the basement parking garage of the World Trade Center killed six people, injured hundreds, and destroyed a half, and half a billion dollars worth of property. Looking back at this incident, which was nearly two decades ago, we can now see that it too was a harbinger of things to come, that this group would morph into a worldwide movement that would mount a series of deadly attacks around the world. And as in the Hitchcock film, uh, completely changing uh, world history and the dynamic. And this is the challenge I think posed for contemporary societies by terrorism. There are dangers in overreacting, but there are also dangers in not reacting. Many commentators are fond of pointing out that terrorism has ancient roots. For example, some have claimed that terrorism can be traced back to the first century AD when Jewish zealots in Judea province rebelled, killing prominent collaborators with Roman rule. It's an interesting observation, but I think in fact the threat of terrorism is substantially different today than in any previous period of human history. Consider this, in 1854, London was the most populated city in the world, and Soho was the most densely populated neighborhood in London. It had a density of 400 people per acre. In contrast, on September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers sat on approximately one acre of land, and on a typical workday, they harbored 50,000 people. Even if Al-Qaeda had existed in 1854, it would have been very difficult for the organization to have taken the lives of nearly 3,000 people in a, single in a single coordinated attack. In 1800, about 7% of Americans lived in urban areas. In 2012, more than 80% do. By 2015, there will be 23 cities in the world that have more than 10 million inhabitants. This level of urban density has a whole host of benefits, but it also provides an unparalleled opportunity for mass destruction of human life. With enough ammunition to destroy just two buildings, attackers focusing on the World Trade Center Twin Towers had the potential to take as many lives as all of the losses Americans experienced in 10 years of the Vietnamese War. And combine this fact with the increasing ability of technology to give smaller and smaller organizations access to increasingly deadly weapons, and we have what is likely to be an ongoing global challenge for the foreseeable future. Fortunately, 911 has turned out to be a rare event, a black swan. But unfortunately, the bursty nature of terrorist attacks is likely to make the threat of terrorism a more or less permanent feature of the 21st century. Thanks for your attention, and uh, I have some time for questions. Yes, please. Thank you. 
Right. If it were possible, presumably it would be a lot more productive. It would attract that large a group. Um, similarly, a lot of political terrorism is instrumental because people have a particular history of perpetrators. And some are just reckless, but a lot of them don't even have a goal. So um, a hypothesis is that um, one of the reasons why this can be found is that people haven't achieved their goals. And of course, Hector. Yeah, great paper by him. Yeah. Well, I think actually I know with in the area of near repeats, uh, it's a pretty recent concept, and I think nobody to this point has a definitive answer. I think what you're saying is makes some good sense for hypotheses. I think another thing that you want to put in is is of what how the society responds. I mean, the reason in some ways 911 wasn't bursty is we had an overwhelming response to 911, and if you look at the number of failed and foiled attacks since 911, it goes up dramatically. Likewise, uh, police are getting more sophisticated when, in responding to burglary. So you can impact the burstiness of things if you are on the ball and you get out there and, and do something about it. Uh, in terms of why it's bursty, though, I think people tend, well, we know ordinary criminals go back to the same place because they're familiar with it. We know that, in a sense, people go the easy way, and they probably are somewhat lazy. If it worked before, they're going to go back. So uh, if, you, if you find a, a, a strategy that works, you tend to return to it unless you're interrupted by something else. But I think uh, there's some fascinating, it's amazing. If you, look at, um, if, you look at a G, if you look at just at maps of the distribution of burglaries in Chicago, IED attacks in Baghdad, terrorist attacks in um, the Etta homeland, and gang activity in Los Angeles, it's amazing how similar those graphs look, those maps. So I think there's some, you know, they're not going to be explained by the same things, but there's some real interesting underlying similarities that we're just beginning to get into. Thanks. Yes, please. Um, could you uh, acknowledge what we haven't resolved is how we measure a um, limit adapted solely to where the elk is alive? Where's the city where the elk? Uh, your, your main effort is to use bursting. Sure. Is that a possibility? Of course. I mean, it, and you know, it's not like in this situation you can then reach off the shelf and find, okay, here's ground truth. We'll get this out and compare it to the database and see if we're right. Uh, I mean, we're, you know, you just have to go with different sources. And there are quite a few things you can do. Like, for example, we assume that we probably measure more serious events better. Uh, so you can look at how trends compare across those. But yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is establish a baseline. What's, what's gotten very interesting about this, though, because this database is now, I mean, it gets something like 2 million web hits a month now. And so we're starting to get, you know, somebody from Pakistan or Turkey saying, well, you know, this incident in 2005, you got it, it's totally bollocked up that, you know, go back and fix it. So, you know, which actually gets you, in fact, it, in, in distinction with criminology, the problem we always have, the reason why there's still no decent international data in crime is governments have a lot of reason to lie about their crime rates. It's interesting, though, with terrorism, it's getting increasingly possible to work around governments and go directly to other sources. You may be following, we have a project in the works, for example, that's going to try to study uh, Twitter feeds. But like half the information we're getting now out of Somalia is coming from analysis of Twitter feeds. So. I think there's some fascinating new ways. I mean, that 30 years ago, I figured by the time I was at this stage of my career, there'd be decent international data on crime. And I think it's actually worse now than it was 
30 years ago. But these other sources are offering some real opportunities. And so our job as scientists, though, I think, is to as much as possible take these data and compare them to data that are collected more traditionally and see if they hold up. But, you know, of course, that's a valid question. Yes, please. Yes. Aaron, my GTD data manager is cringing. I keep forgetting to update this. We have data, in fact, we will soon have it up to 2011. The story doesn't change at all, though. Um, it pretty consistently, we run about 50% about of the events in the database have no fatalities. The number of fatalities has gone up a bit over time. It used to be the old saying that Brian Jenkins is tri attributed with a terrorism expert from RAND said that terrorists want a lot of people watching, not a lot of people dead. But that was much truer in the 70s and 80s. And he actually revised it recently to say that people, terrorists want a lot of people watching and a lot of people dead. The number of fatalities per attack has gone up pretty dramatically in the last, say, 15 years. So, yes, please. Hey, Michael. I think I might have a slide that it's not ours, but yeah, here's one. Yeah, you can see this. Okay, this is actually uh, collected by one of our former students, Kevin Strom at uh, Research Triangle, but it shows the number of foiled terrorist plots in green in the United, just, just for the United States since uh, 1999. And clearly, you know, through either good work, luck, or both, we've foiled a lot of plots over this period of time. I mean, the interesting question is how long can you sort of stay lucky? But if you start really counting up, and it, in some ways it doesn't really even get a lot of news anymore because it's become so common. So yeah, I think the response end has been incredibly important. Uh, and that kind of gets back to the other gentleman's question. I mean, you know, burstiness can be interrupted. I mean, we were pretty successful at stopping. We completely stopped aerial hijackings until we got hijackers willing to take their own lives in the United States. There were no aerial hijackings for a period of time up to 911, but then when you get people willing to, to go down with the plane, it changes the whole uh, situation. So yes, we can have a, we clearly can have an impact, which I guess we could put that as another myth. The idea that, you know, it's sort of like, you know, an act of nature is also a myth. I mean, we can do things to prevent this and have been, in lots of cases, pretty successful. Um, so, uh, one, yes, please. Yeah. Could you just talk briefly about the players, the terrorists themselves? And I remember when you organized a symposium, I think about a year ago downtown, uh, it was with your exciting uh, task force, which I think you had three or four people who had been terrorists and have now uh, uh, decided not to be terrorists. What, what do you know about the sorts of, why those sorts of changes take place? Do you have any understanding of? Well, that's a, a great question. I, I was joking about the professor in the Tweety jacket doing barbarian studies, but the fact is we actually have done a lot of work uh, that actually examines either former terrorists or, amazingly, current terrorists who are very happy to talk to you online. I mean, it's a bit creepy, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, John Sawyer is in the back here, a new project that's just beginning where we're planning to track in great detail about the, the life histories of 1,500 uh, terrorists over time. So yes, I think we are beginning to. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of the collaborators we have in the consortium, uh, Rick McCauley, has recently claimed that there's essentially 12 different routes for terrorists to get into the business, and they can be quite different. One of the unsettling things is, you know, some of the folks, uh, it's incredible to me when you read these life histories, sometimes people are willing to strap on a suicide vest that do not seem to have a long-term ideological commitment. I mean, a lot of people get into terrorist organizations because, you know, they have a boyfriend or they're in the same football league. I mean, it's, sometimes it, 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 there is a long ideological history, but not always. I think, uh, you know, when we got into this business, we had a very commonsensical view of how it happened, too. 
there was a kind of notion that you kind of go through this lockstep process and you know you get more and more radicalized and eventually you start acting on it. But you know, for the psychologists in the room, we all know, and you know, psychology 101 tells us the link between behavior and attitudes is remarkably weak. So you get people who are incredibly radical in what they say, but they don't act on it. You also get people who act that don't seem to be that radical. So I think we're gonna find a lot of variation when we actually get down to the to the you know, serious individual level cases. That's been harder to do, but there is starting to be a lot more of it uh, out there. So, yeah, thank you. So I guess uh, uh, we're over time a little bit, so I, maybe this would be a great time to thank you all again, and I wanna welcome everyone. We've got uh, refreshments at the back of the room, and thank you very much. <laughs>